Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then we consider what you know of the news of the day. Amna Vice President and MP of Baradatut Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob will be sworn in as the country's ninth Prime Minister at 2pm tomorrow. The focus now turns to the formation of the Cabinet. Now, Mohidin Yassin's administration had 36 ministers and minister-level advisors and envoys and 37 deputy ministers. That was a total of 73 positions. 55 of the 115 MPs that supported the Brigata National Government had an executive job. So what will Ismail Sabri's government look like? Well, will we see a shake-up or a downsizing of cabinet? Or will we possibly see more posts awarded in the name of coalition stability? Let's ask Dr. James Chin. He's a professor of Asian studies at the Asia Institute of University of Tasmania in Australia. James, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. I know it's very late where you are, but um, let's begin our conversation looking at um, most recent news. It's Michael Sabri as ninth prime minister. James, when did it become clear to you that Ismail Sabri had won this race. At any point in the week, did you think there could have been any other conclusion? Right, I think uh, for me personally, I think it was quite clear around Tuesdays and Wednesdays when it was quite clear that when Shafiq Abdel approached the Sarat leadership for support, when they said no to uh, Shafiq Abdel, it was quite clear that they were trying to support uh, behind the UMNO candidate. So it wasn't really a, a two-horse race, as many people uh, said. Uh, but I think uh, the outcome was still shocking for many people uh, for the very simple reason that uh, if you were to ask Malaysians or anybody uh, keeping an eye on Malaysian politics uh, two and a half years ago, very few people would have named uh, Ismail Sabri as a prime minister material. So uh, the fact that this guy has come out of nowhere within a short space of two years, has become a Prime Minister of Malaysia. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. But James, he was the Deputy Prime Minister in the Muhyiddin Yassin administration. And perhaps, and if you could respond to this, you know, was he a bridge between the two factions that had kind of developed over the, the 17 months that uh, Muhyiddin Yassin was in charge? Uh, he wasn't so much uh, uh, acting as a bridge in Amno. In fact, uh, he was basically supported by Muyadin, who tried to split Amno up. So he was the faction in Amno that kept uh, trying to make sure that Amno did not pull out of the Perikatan government. So to claim that he was a bridge is absolutely wrong. I think it was quite clear that uh, it wasn't only him, but the whole group of the Amno uh, MPs who were serving in the government. Uh, they wanted to keep the government intact, uh, but Najib and Zahid had other plans, and uh, they were quite, uh, what do you call it, quite good in, in planning for the destruction of the Perikatan government. But really, the trigger point was on July the 29th, when the king issued a statement uh, talking about the attorney general and the law minister uh, not doing what was agreed upon. I think that was the tipping point. Uh, after that, nothing could have saved the Muyadin government. Can I ask you, moving forward, uh, you know, f all focus will be on um, uh, positions being filled in the cabinet. And um, Ismail Sabri will have the task of balancing what is widely seen to be public distaste for a bloated cabinet, along with the need for him to uh, reward support and uh, to shore up coalition stability. I'm just wondering, um, James, how you think he's going to make that balance? Which side of that equation do you think um, he will uh, um, he will side to? So I don't think we can expect uh, major changes to the cabinet in terms of numbers. Uh, my take is that a lot of deals were done to ensure that he gets uh, 114 and that he has to uh, keep his part of the deal or reward the people who support him. So in terms of numbers in cabinet, I expect to be uh, roughly the same, around 30 to 35, and uh, one or two special envoys. And also people who are outside will be given some sort of a, a government-linked post uh, to keep them happy. 
So really, it's uh, it will probably be uh, I wouldn't use the word bloated, but it is the reality of trying to put together a very difficult coalition uh, in order to uh, form a new government. Uh, now, having said that, I also expect him to leave a couple of uh, vacancies uh, because obviously, with such a slim majority, he wants to keep a couple of empty positions so he can bring uh, more people over to his government. Uh, James, uh, on Twitter, and you were very kind to put all your first responses uh, on a Twitter. You said that this is an AMNO BN back in power 2.0 rather than PN 2.0. Do you think there's going to be a rebranding exercise? And why do you think it's BN 2.0 rather than PN 2.0? Right. So uh, I mentioned earlier about the LDP analogy. So if you remember your history, so AMNO and Liberal Democratic Party in Japan are very similar. Uh, in political science, they're seen as a dominant party. In other words, although there are lots of parties in the system, uh, they managed to win most elections. So if you see the LDP, the first time they were defeated was around in the early 1990s. Uh, they were out of power, if I'm not mistaken, for slightly uh, about two years plus. Uh, just after two years, very similar to Amno. So Amno was out of power for uh, just just uh, two years plus before they came back into power. Uh, so the analogy is 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 really similar. And my point is that uh, if you look at the history of Amno, it's very clear that every time they are in the driver's seat, uh, basically it's Amno government. Uh, they will not allow uh, anybody else to take over. So the other prediction I'll make is that I think uh, Besatu is in big trouble now. They no longer control the office of the prime minister. So I suspect uh, once the government is stabilized, AMNO will spend a bit of energy and resources uh, trying to either absorb Besatu or destroy at the next general election. And when do you think that might be, James? I mean, how soon do you think there will be an election? Well, it depends on the majority uh, during the confidence vote. So if he doesn't get a big majority and the government is unstable, I suspect uh, the opposition will still give him a bit of honeymoon. So basically, we're talking about a confidence vote in September, and the following month, it will be the budget process. Uh, towards the end, nobody wants to do anything in December. Uh, January is out because it's Chinese New Year. So he will have uh, quite... A number of months, so-called the honeymoon months, where nobody will really disturb him. I suspect uh, increasingly as we head towards uh, the COVID thing, uh, that there's a consensus building among the political elites that uh, the political system cannot go back uh, to a normal situation unless you get a clear result from the right yard. And the only way you can get a clear result is that you go for a general election. Uh, don't forget, if you look at the Malay ground in the last election, right, it was quite interesting. The vote was basically split three ways. So uh, they really have to go back to the ground to get a clear result who speaks for the Malay community. And the only way to do it is to hold a GE. So I suspect uh, they will have a GE uh, sometime next year, uh, probably the second half of next year. James, uh, you also noted that you think that GPS, uh, Gabogan Party Sarawak, are a big winner in this scenario. Could you kind of elaborate on that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, so at the start of the week, uh, after the resignation, especially the desperate speech given on Friday where he tried to reach out to the opposition, uh, once the opposition rejected the so-called uh, peace deal given by uh, Mu Yeding, both sides were scrambling. Everybody understood that one of the big prize was the, was the 18 MPs, the GPS block. Uh, when it was clear early in the week by Monday or Tuesday that... Uh, uh, GPS wasn't going to go with Arno or Shafi. Uh, Arno knew that they had to negotiate a special deal for GPS to come in. So I think uh, GPS will, will do very well out of this process. Uh, right now they have, uh, uh, you know, the number of ministers in the old government was really, uh, uh, you know, was really a, a, a lot more compared to all the other small parties. So I expect them to at least retain the same level of representation and there's also thought that they may even get the deputy prime ministership. James, was this, I want to talk about the opposition. I'm just wondering whether um, the past few weeks we've seen, is this purely an internal, uh, was this a, an AMNO takeover of the Prikata national government and the opposition is really looking at, the, at this from the outside? Or 
were there things that the opposition could have done? And I'm just wondering where the opposition could have could go from here. Uh, if you look at the structure of Malaysian politics, I think uh, on the one hand, at the start of the process, it was clear Anwar Ibrahim had the bigger numbers. The problem is, uh, uh, the problem is that nobody on well, on the government side, at least on the Barisan uh, side and on the Perikatan side. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about the DAP. So uh, the only way for Anwar to uh, move over and create a new government was to abandon the DAP. And again, uh, from his perspective, I think that was not doable. So as long as the DAP card is, is, is not part of the mix, I think it would have been uh, very difficult either way. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the moment GPS signaled that it wasn't going to go with the opposition side, I think uh, at that point, uh, people understood that, you know, uh, that uh, AMNO had, had a simple majority. And that's exactly what we got today. Uh, James, what do you uh, or how do you rate the role of the palace in this saga, this five day saga, um, noting that, you, as you said, that the displeasure of His Majesty expressed a month ago um, was kind of a, a red line that the Perikata National, or at least Muiden, had crossed. Uh, how do you think, uh, you know, um, they p played their cards in this particular saga? I think if you were to uh, look at their actions carefully, I think they were very mindful of, uh, of the, uh, the trust placed in them by the Constitution. But I think they were also very, very careful you have to remember last year in February when the king uh, picked Muyadin to be the prime minister, there was a very strong blowback, especially from the Malay community, uh, because there was one other person who claimed to actually have a, a bigger number of MPs supporting him and that the king refused to see him. So this time, I think they were being very, very careful. So, for example, we know that, you know, uh, after the SDs were submitted, uh, the palace double checked uh, that the ASDs were actually uh, done freely. Uh, it was done correctly. So I think the palace was very, very careful to make sure that uh, this time everything was above board. Um, I think the process itself uh, was very similar to last year. Uh, party consultation with the leaders and MPs took place. Statutory declarations were signed. Uh, then the conference of rulers, where all the Malay rulers got together to discuss. Uh, you know, the findings of the SD and, and other discussion. And from there, uh, they decided that, you know, Ismail Sabri was the best candidate. So basically, the, the, the formula or the protocol they used was fairly similar to 2020. And in some ways, I think they also didn't have a choice uh, because at the end of the day, uh, they are a constitutional monarchy. And the only reason that they had to step in this time was because uh, the politicians lost their plot. Uh, if the politicians had not lost their plot, uh, we would not have seen the, the king uh, taking such an active interest. Thank you so much, James. That was political analyst James Chin. We're going to take a quick break, but after this, we'll speak to human rights.